tarde. Eh, es un placer eh, aquí estar con todos ustedes. Eh, mi nombre es Daniel Osowiki, yo soy historiador. También soy el Sheliach de la Ciencia Judaica aquí en Brasil, el Sheliach también de Atenua Betar y profesor voluntario eh, de Stand With Us eh, en Brasil. Este es evento de lanzamiento del libro Cartas a un nuevo vecino palestino, publicado en no Brasil por la editora Contexto por iniciativa de Stand With Us Brasil, con indispensable apoyo de sus doadores. A Stand With Us es una organización internacional focada en educar sobre Israel, contribuyendo para el debate sobre el país y mitigando el antisemitismo y el antisionismo. El lanzamiento es una acción conjunta con la Congregación Israelita Paulista, la CIPI, y con la Academia Judaica, un proyecto de la CIPI focado en no el aprofundamiento y en la diversidad del judaísmo. Além de mí, contamos hoy con la presencia de otro debatador, el señor eh, Raúl César Gottlieb. Eh, Raúl eh, César Gottlieb es ingeniero, director de la revista de Barín, es presidente del directorio del Movimiento Reformista para América Latina y del Instituto Iberoamericano de Formación Rabínica Reformista. Buenas tardes, Raúl. Buenas tardes, es un placer estar aquí e contribuir com esse evento tão importante, nesse trabalho tão importante que a Stand With Us faz, de trazer literatura judaica moderna, sionista, é, para o nosso idioma. Nós temos uma carência muito grande disso, então é importantíssimo. E, evidentemente, que o livro do, do Yossi Kainalev é um ponto alto nessa trajetória. Muito obrigado, Raul, pelas suas palavras. E, obviamente... Nosso outro participante é o autor do livro, o reconhecido escritor Yossi Klein Alevi. Yossi é membro sênior do Shalom Hartman Institute em Jerusalém, juntamente com o imã Abdullah Antepli, da Duke University, dirige a iniciativa da, de liderança musulmana do Instituto MLI, que enseña jovens líderes musulmanes, musulmanos americanos emergentes sobre judaísmo, identidade judaica e Israel. Seu último livro, Letters to my Palestinian Neighbor, que agora lançamos no Brasil, é um best-seller do New York Times. Ele escreve para as principais páginas de opinião dos Estados Unidos, incluindo o Times e o Wall Street Journal, e é um ex-editor colaborador também do New Republic. Então, boa noite, Yossi. Realmente é um prazer ter aqui a você conosco. Realmente temos muito que falar sobre seu livro, mas, primeiramente, queremos saber sobre o processo da escritura do livro. Como foi que isso começou? Well, first of all, it's wonderful to be with all of you, and uh, thank you for for honoring my, my work. I'm, I'm very grateful as a writer and uh, I'm, it's, it's just very exciting for me to, to be with you. The, um, the book actually began with a, um, an experience of, uh, of insomnia. I, um, I wasn't able to sleep uh, through the night And I would sit here in my office where I'm, I'm sitting now in Jerusalem, looking out on the next hill, literally on the next hill where there are two Palestinian villages, maybe a thousand meters from where I'm sitting and separating my apartment, which is in the last row of, uh, of buildings in Jerusalem. The West Bank is on the next hill and separating my neighborhood from those Palestinian villages is the security barrier, the wall. And I would, sit, I would be sitting here late at night, unable to sleep, looking at the lights across the way and wondering uh, who's, who's awake at three, four in the morning and um, listening to the 
muezzin, the call to prayer, two in the morning, four in the morning, five, and by then the day is beginning. And this was going on night after night. And one night I started to imagine as if I were having a conversation with my Palestinian neighbor on the next hill, who is so close, but inaccessible because of this, this barrier and because of the situation. And I started to have this imaginary conversation where I was explaining who I am, why I live here, why the Jewish people came back to this land that we believe is our home, a home that we share with another people. And all of the, the things that I wished I could explain, I, I found myself starting to write and not on a computer, longhand, you know, old fashioned as if I'm writing a letter, dear neighbor, I don't know your name. I don't know anything about you, but we're so intimate. We, we can see each other's lights in the middle of the night. And, um, and that's how it began. And I didn't really think of it initially as, as a book. I didn't think of it as, as, I didn't know what I would do with it. It was just something to do in the middle of the night. And, uh, I was working on a previous book at the time, uh, which was uh, a very difficult project and was not going easily. And whenever I would want to have some relief from that book, I would start writing, working on another letter. And, uh, and that's how the project began. And then it began to, it really took a life of its own. Okay. Um... Muy obrigado, Yossi, eh, pela sua resposta. E eu gostaria, agora, depois de, de escutar esta interessante introdução que Yossi fez, eh, passar a palavra para Raúl, eh, para que ele comece também com outras perguntas que a gente tem preparadas. Ok, okay so, Yossi, you address your letters to the Palestinian neighbor, uh, not to the Palestinian leadership. Uh, does it indicate that you believe this is a certain degree, maybe big or small degree of misunderstanding between the Palestinians? I, I, I refer Palestinians as the Israeli Arabs as well, because they are misspelled as Israeli Arabs, they are Palestinian Arabs, uh, Palestinian Israelis, and the Palestinian Palestinians. You, you think that there's a big misunderstanding between them, between the Israeli population, and the Palestinian population in this region, and, and uh, that we don't understand each other, and this is why we have this conflict that is going forever. Uh, you think that explaining it will make something, it, it will make a difference? You know, it's interesting. Amos Oz, the, the late uh, Israeli novelist, uh, once said that the problem between Israelis and Palestinians isn't that we don't understand each other, it's that we understand each other too well. And both sides want the same thing. They both want the same land. So in one way, I don't think there's a misunderstanding about the basic conflict. We both, both sides understand that, uh, that the other believes that all of this land from the Jordan River to the Mediterranean Sea belongs to them. And this is a war over, over, over a shared uh, patrimony. Uh, and in another sense, I think though that, that certainly the Palestinian side and the Arab world in general uh, understands very little about who the Jews are. Um, I, what, what, I, what I've experienced in my work with Muslim Jewish relations is that Muslims don't understand what it means for the Jews to be a people. Um, Muslims tend to say we have no problem with the Jews as a religion, it's only Zionism that we, 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 we have a problem with. And the, the core of my understanding of, of Jewish identity is that we are a people with a particular religious 
identity. And so what I was really, the, 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 the first thing I was trying to explain in this book before even getting into the conflict is who, who are the Jews? And why do, we, why do we have an attachment, a religious attachment? And I'm speaking as a religious Jew and I'm writing this book as a religious Jew to what I imagine to be a religious Muslim. And what is the connection between, between people, religion, land? How does it all fit together? And that really comes out of, you, you had mentioned uh, uh, the, the, Daniel, you had mentioned the, the Muslim Leadership Initiative project that I'm, I'm involved with. And so I've had, I've had almost a decade of, of experience working with Muslim American leaders uh, who come from the most educated backgrounds. They come from, from the best American universities uh, and yet have very little understanding of how Jews understand themselves. And my purpose in, in this book is the same purpose that I have with this Muslim uh, project, the Muslim American project. It's not to convince anyone of my narrative. It's to explain how Jews understand themselves. That's all. And, and that's my job. I, I, I can't do anything more than that. Um, and so, but I do have a responsibility to try to explain to my neighbors who we are and what they're not understanding about us. Because when they read about us in their newspapers and magazines and, and hear about us on their, on, on, in their on their TV shows, we are not recognizable to me. We, we're, 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 we're not a people, we're, 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 we're thieves, we, we, we invented our story, we have no roots in this land. And so I felt this need to write the book and to invite my neighbor to respond. This was not intended to be a one-way preaching. I'm telling you my story and I would like to hear your story. And just as you're not going to convince me of your narrative, I won't convince you either. But the reason why I felt that maybe with this, I'll, 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 I'll end now. The reason that I felt we need to hear each other's narratives is because the way in which this, this conflict is conducted is as an attempt to erase the other side. The other side is not a real people, and there are many Jews, many Israelis on the right who will say the same about the Palestinians. It's not only Palestinians who say that we're not a real people, they're not a real people either. And so at the very least, let's get to the point where we understand that we're fighting uh, as two actual real peoples. <laughs> and, and if we can get to that point, I think that we'll really be making a major step forward in this conflict. Muy do obrigado, yeah. Yossi, eh, pela resposta. Eh, Raúl, você quisiera decir alguma coisa mais? Yeah, uh, there is a there is a uh, an idea to try to solve the conflict or to try to ameliorate the conflict by step by step, little steps ameliorating the situation of the lives of the Palestinians in the West Bank. And in this way, to become less aggressive uh, between the people and, and to reach something in a few years, in a long time or short time. But what do you think about that? Look, I think that we have to do it for basic decency. For, for, for moral reasons. If you're asking me honestly whether I think it's going to contribute, um, you know, Israelis are understandably very skeptical. And um, certainly Israelis of my generation who lived through the Oslo process in the 1990s, remember that we tried to do that. There were joint economic ventures. There were real attempts to, the international community invested billions of dollars into the Palestinian Authority. And where did it go? 
it certainly didn't go to, to better people's lives. I don't think there was any political entity that was the recipient of so much foreign aid and goodwill as the Palestinian Authority in the 1990s. And, uh, and most of it went to corruption or to, to, to the militias, uh, certainly in Gaza. And so, so, yes, we have to do it. We have to try. But I, I'm skeptical, as I think most Israelis of my generation tend to be. Where I find more hope is in the changes happening in the region. And we're seeing those changes happening literally in the next couple of days where the Saudis are in all likelihood going to be making some step toward normalizing relations with Israel. The, the reports here are that, that the Saudis are not going to go too far, but, but there will be some announcement with President Biden going back and forth between Israel and Saudi Arabia. And the reason that I'm mentioning this in the context of the Palestinian issue is because the only way that I believe we're going to solve this is through a regional agreement. The Israelis and the Palestinians, we can resume negotiations. I don't believe we're going to get anywhere. We know each other's negotiating positions. Uh, by memory, each side understands the other's red lines. I'm hoping that we can bring in the Saudis, the Gulf states, uh, Jordan and, and Egypt, and begin creating an, an economic infrastructure and a security infrastructure for Israel. And by, by conceiving of a, of a regional solution, I think that uh, we, we take this out of the context in which it's been stuck for 25 years. And you know, something amazing is happening in the Middle East. And that is that we're seeing the beginnings of normalization between Israel and parts of the Arab world. We're seeing the end of the Arab-Israeli conflict as we knew it. Now there's still a Palestinian-Israeli conflict and there's an Israeli-Shiite conflict, an Israeli conflict with Iran and Iran's allies, Hezbollah, Hamas, Syria. Uh, so the conflict is by no means over and Israel still has to deal with a great deal of, uh, of, of danger. But the, the conflict that I grew up with, the conflict that, 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 that I took for granted as permanent, the Arab-Israeli conflict of the 1970s and 80s and 90s, that conflict is ending. And it's, it's ending in these days as we're, as, as, we're, as we're speaking. And so we need to really begin to think outside of the Palestinian-Israeli conflict and think, begin to think regionally. You know, when, um, when Israelis think of this conflict, it's, it's very different from how the conflict is perceived by outsiders. Israelis don't only see Israel versus the Palestinians. Israel versus the Palestinians, we are Goliath and they're David. But if you widen the conflict, if you widen the lens and you think of the region, then you'll see how Israelis experience the conflict, which is that we are the only non-Arab, non-Muslim state for thousands of kilometers. And what we need to do is really bring in those parts of the Arab world that are ready to make peace with us, that are making peace with us, and, and, and bring the Palestinian issue into the Abraham Accords. So, so my answer to you really is, of course, we need to, to improve the lives of people on the ground. But I'm not, I'm not ready to abandon the vision of, of, of uh, trying to solve this conflict. And what's happening in the region, I think, gives us an opportunity, if not, if not immediately, and I don't think it's really going to happen anytime soon, but it's possibly laying the, the foundations for a long-term regional solution. Thank you. Obrigado, Yossi. 
É, agora é, eu vou fazer uma pergunta, talvez um pouco difícil, mas uma pergunta que a gente recebeu, elaborou, e é a seguinte. É, sendo que muitos governos ocidentais com altos níveis de democracia têm declarado ao movimento VDS como movimento antisemita, por que você decidiu colocar algumas cartas no final do livro de alguns membros desse movimento? Sim. Yes. Why did I, is the question, why did I include them? Yes. What is the objective? You know, my, um, my point, well, first of all, just to take it, before I answer the question, uh, let me explain the difficulty that I had in ending the book with the Palestinian narrative. Now, this is a book that I wrote to explain and defend the Israeli narrative. And I knew that I wanted to include Palestinian responses, but I wasn't sure that I really wanted to give the Palestinians the last word in my book. And in the end, I decided that I'm not going to respond to their letters in the book. I responded to each one of them, of course, personally, And some of them have become friends and, and others uh, I've, I've had correspondence with. But I made the decision to end the book with Palestinian, the Palestinian counter narrative for several reasons. One is I wanted to honor those Palestinians who had the goodwill and the courage to respond to me because none of those letter writers had to respond to me. They could have all ignored me. And, uh, and instead they chose to engage with me. And the invitation that I put out in this book was not to engage with me on my terms, but engage with me on your terms. All I ask is that we have a respectful disagreement. We're never going to agree, Palestinians and Israelis. We're never going to agree about who's responsible for the refugee problem of 1948, or who's responsible for the collapse of the Oslo process. We can't agree on what happened a few weeks ago with the, with the, with the death of the Palestinian American journalist. Yes. Was she killed accidentally in the crossfire between Israelis and Palestinians? Was she killed accidentally by an Israeli? Was she killed deliberately by an Israeli? Was she killed deliberately by an Israeli under orders from the Israeli army to kill journalists? That's the Palestinian narrative. For Israelis, that's ridiculous. But we, we can't agree on anything. And so what I wanted to model in this book was a respectful disagreement over everything. And the only thing that I really expected, in, and, and these are the letters that I did include at the end, if you'll, if, you'll, if you'll read them carefully, every one of those letters, even the BDS supporters, agree that the Jews are a people and that this is a conflict between two peoples that live in this land and have to come to terms. Even the BDS activist uh, from Australia, Palestinian uh, who lives in Australia, uh, he says he accepts the argument that the Jews have, have roots in this land and we have to, both sides have to come to terms with each other. If you don't recognize my right to be here at all, then I have really nothing to talk to you about. But if you're ready to engage with me on the basic premise of this book, which is that this is a conflict between two indigenous peoples, two peoples that belong to this land, then I'm ready to disagree with you about everything else. Because that, for me, is the heart of the conflict. And if you're ready to accept the legitimacy of a Jewish majority state, then I'm ready to, to argue with you about everything. And if you're asking me why I included BDS supporters, most Palestinians are BDS supporters. And what I was really trying to do here is engage Palestinians where they are without compromising where I am. 
I don't feel that I gave in on any point of my own narrative. And if you as a Palestinian are ready to engage with my narrative, then I'll accept you as you are and, and we'll talk. You know, the other, the other thing here is that I don't represent anybody. I'm not a government official. I, um, I'm a writer. I, I, I represent myself. And I'm ready to engage with anyone who's ready to engage with me. That's, that's my, my approach here. Muito obrigado. Eh, Raúl, você quer continuar com outra pergunta? Yeah, I can, I can make a question. Yes. Uh, uh, of course, I, I, not of course, but I believe that with the uh, uh, normalization of the Arab Israeli conflict and uh, the Palestinian Israeli conflict will be uh, in a completely different uh, shape. Okay? So I, 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 I would, I'd like to ask you, what will be, what in your opinion will be the reaction of the Palestinian leadership to this new situation that is building? I, 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 I'm, I'm looking here in Israel, I live now in Israel, and I see many, many tourists that come from the Emirates here. It's amazing, we didn't have that, now there are plenty. So how the how the the, the 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 leadership of the Palestinians they are going to react to these Arabs what, what's going to happen there is not that danger that uh, is going to break everything there look the 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 Palestinian leadership is one of the tragedies of the Palestinian people because the leadership reacts to any change in the same way it's always no And the leadership is reacting in the same way now to the Abraham Accords, rather than accepting the invitation of, uh, of the Gulf states to join, to begin the process, uh, it's once again, uh, no. So I don't have any hope for the Palestinian leadership uh, at this point. Uh, I also don't have any hope for the Israeli leadership. My own leadership is, uh, is stuck. And um, we do have leaders on our side uh, who want a two-state solution. Yair Lapid, the head of the centrist uh, Yesh Atid party, there is a future party. Uh, certainly uh, there, is a, um, there are Israeli leaders who want a two-state solution, uh, but that's not where the real uh, weight of the Israeli public is right now. And I don't think it's where the weight of the Palestinian public is either. So in that sense, the leadership of uh, both sides, uh, which is not interested in the two-state solution, uh, probably reflects where the majorities of both peoples are right now. Now, I wouldn't have said this 10 years ago, because 10 years ago, I believe, or 15 years ago, there was an Israeli majority for a two-state solution. But uh, people get tired. They, they, there's a great deal of despair. And, uh, and I understand the despair. I understand that on both sides. I think, I think both sides have done uh, a very good job of convincing the other that there's no one to make peace with. So um, I, I, I don't look toward the leadership. And um, you know, when, uh, when this book came out, I was invited to go to Ramallah and meet Palestinian leaders. And then two days before uh, I was supposed to go, I was uninvited. And, uh, and so that, that for me, you know, and, and I didn't expect, I didn't, I didn't expect anything to even come out of the meeting. So I was really, I'm really looking for conversations with Palestinians who are not in the leadership because the leadership I think is, is stuck in a very bad state of mind. But do you think that we can move somewhere without the leadership? Do you think that in Israel, in the Palestine, and in Palestine, there will be a move to change this, this leadership to something more representative of the people? Look, I think that one of the, the tragedies of the Palestinian national movement is that so far it's only created two very bad alternatives. 
There's either the Palestinian Authority, which everyone knows is deeply corrupt, uh, or there's Hamas, which is spiritually corrupt. Uh, where is the, the, a third force in Palestinian society? Where is a party representing the middle class, the people who really want a decent future for their kids? And I know those people. I know they're there. Why isn't there an expression, a political expression uh, of, the, of that force? Now, I do know people, there are people on the Palestinian side who have very courageously created small groups to engage with Israelis, small, small groups of rec for reconciliation, but there's no organized political force. And until there is, until there's going to be a political force to challenge either the, the P, to challenge the PA and Hamas, I don't believe that, that we're going to really have progress, so. So maybe this, the Arab countries can force to create this kind of, of movement in the Palestinians. Do you believe that? That's my, that's my hope. Exactly, exactly that, that the Arab world is going to get to the point where it's so fed up, so frustrated with the Palestinian leadership. And I think we're starting to see that. If you listen carefully to, to what, what some of the Arab leaders are saying, they're basically arguing that they're not going to allow the Palestinian leadership to have a veto over a better future for the Middle East. That's really a, a, a transformation. Mm -hmm. And what I'm hoping will happen is not that, Pal that this generation of Palestinian leaders will suddenly say, oh, let's join this peace, this peace momentum. But that ordinary Palestinians will, will say, why are we allowing one opportunity after another to, uh, to go by? Daniel, você quer falar? Sim, muito obrigado, Yossi. Eu gostaria de fazer agora outra, outra pergunta, um pouco mais esperançadora. Né? Vamos a falar que, sem dúvida, seu livro é uma mensagem de convivência e paz para as gerações futuras. Como você avalia a educação que as crianças palestinas e israelenses estão recebendo hoje em dia nesse sentido. The conditions are so far from being right for an agreement, and that's one of the major reasons for it. Uh, there are, there is a major stumbling block on our side, which is expanding settlements. And I don't believe that we've reached the point where a two-state solution is not physically possible. I don't think we're there yet, but we're getting closer to that point. On the Palestinian side, the major obstacle is that instead of the leadership preparing their people for peace, even during the Oslo years. You know, I, um, my kids were, were going through school in the Oslo years. I remember, you know, that my daughter would come home from kindergarten waving a little peace flag with a Jewish star and a dove. And this is what they were doing in, uh, in Israeli schools. In Palestinian schools, we now know that they were learning about uh, from the river to the sea, Palestine will be free and that uh, the, there is no peace to be made with the Jews. And so on their side, it's this culture of denial. And that's really the denial of Jewish roots in this land, the denial of a Jewish story, the denial of the Holocaust, the denial of Jewish history. That's, that's basic to, to how one after another of Palestinians have been taught and not only Palestinians, you'll see it throughout the Arab world. You'll see it in Egypt, supposedly uh, our peace partner. Uh, where it's starting to change is in the Gulf, certainly in the Gulf states and even in Saudi Arabia. There's been very substantial uh, progress made uh, on the school textbooks. 
uh, and how they teach about, about the Jews. On the Palestinian side, it's a disaster. And, um, and that's something that we, we, you know, when I speak to, to foreign groups that come to Israel, journalists or, or diplomats, and, um, and they talk to me about the settlements, I said, you know, I have no problem with the international community pushing the Israeli government to stop expanding settlements on one condition that you also push the Palestinian leadership on what they're causing, their obstacles to peace. Because this, conf this conflict is not just about settlements. It's not just about what Israel is doing. It's also what the other side is doing. And yes, we have the power and they don't, but that doesn't absolve them of responsibility from creating a culture of hatred. If you're really going to, to have a peace process, you need to start preparing the ground. Perfecto. Thanks. Eh, Raúl, ¿puedo seguir? ¿O no, sé no segue, segue, segue. Ok. Eh, la última parte de su libro, como a gente ya tenía hablado, eh, usted presenta diferentes cartas eh, enviadas por el público palestino o musulmán, ¿no? ¿eh? Eu queria perguntar, eh, qual dessas cartas realmente significou para você? Eh, qual dessas cartas colocou mais dúvidas nas suas certezas? Qual foi a mais difícil que você recebeu desde um ponto de vista intelectual? I don't hear a translation. Ok. Ok. Um... I, I can ask in English. In the last part of your book, you present different letters sent by Palestinian or Muslim in public. We we'll read the book, ne? Which of these car uh, letters put your certains in more doubt? The last part of the question, could you repeat? I'm sorry. Which, which of these letters put your certains in more doubt. Your cert, cert, the things that you think that are correct, what? Ah, of, uh, well, you know, I have a very different narrative than, uh, than, than the historical narrative that was expressed in these letters. But what really touched me about most of them was the, the pain and despair especially among young Palestinians. And, mm. you know, sometimes I'm asked, uh, what, um, what changed you? What I, did any of your ideas change? And the truth is that, you know, I've been involved in, in this conflict in one way or another for 40 years. I, this is the 40th anniversary of my moving to Israel, it was 1982. And I worked as a journalist covering this conflict. Uh, I was a soldier, so I experienced the conflict that way. Uh, I, I've been a reconciliation activist. I, I've been involved in very, in different aspects of the same conflict, which means that, that you pretty much have heard it all. <laughs> you know, there aren't really new arguments on either side. But what really touched me about the Palestinian letters was the, uh, the desperation. And the impact that it had on me was, uh, was very personal because I'm responsible for their misery. Now, I believe that Israel at this point doesn't have a choice. I don't believe we can create a Palestinian state now on the West Bank, and I'm speaking about the West Bank here. It's, it's a, a thousand meters away. It's, it's all, the geography is so intimate. And the most likely outcome if we were to create a Palestinian state tomorrow is that I would have Gaza on the next hill. This would turn into Gaza. That's what most Israelis believe. I believe that. And so I can't, I can't create a Palestinian state now, but reading those letters forced me 
to listen to the voices of, of Palestinians, to listen to the voice of Palestinian despair, and to own the consequences of what is being done by Israel. Again, uh, I believe that, that we can't create a Palestinian state now, but I have to own, I have to own what my side is doing. I have to take responsibility for it. And so that's what this experience has really done for me. Point is it's deepened, it's deepened my, my commitment to trying to, to be ready for a solution. And not to just say, well, we tried to make peace in 2000 and 2009, we put offers on the table. Yes, we did. And those offers were rejected. And that's an important part of the record. But at the same time, it's not enough for us to say we tried. We have to keep trying. And we have to explore the possibility with our new allies in the Arab world of whether it's possible, whether there are some new openings that we haven't explored. We need to be, to be we need to take the initiative and, and right now we're, we're, we're very passive on this issue. Yeah. Danielle, may I make two more questions and then we pass to the public? We, we have yes. questions from the public. I don't, I don't uh, know, I'm not aware. I'm I not aware. Did, I didn't receive. Okay. So let me make two questions, one after the other, completely different questions. The first one, what is the role of the Israeli Palestinians in this in the solution of the conflict? They, yeah, they have a, a role. What are the wonderful what is, question? It's a wonderful question, especially in light of developments over the last year. Now, several things happened over the last year that are contradictory in terms of Israel's in the internal relationship between Israeli Arabs and Israeli Jews. Uh, in one way, the relationship got much worse. Uh, a year ago, we had riots uh, in uh, what, the mixed Arab Jewish towns within Israel, where uh, Arab mobs were attacking their Jewish neighbors, and then Jewish mobs began attacking their Arab neighbors. And this was the worst violence that we've had between Arab and Israeli, uh, Arab and Jewish Israeli citizens, probably since 1948. And, and in another way, we've had a major breakthrough in relations with this, with this government. This is the first government in Israel's history that had an Arab party. Now we've had Arab cabinet ministers coming as individuals represent, representing the Labour Party or the left-wing merits, but we've never had an Arab party. And, there is, oh, and there's been very good reason for that. Neither side wanted it. The Arab side didn't want to be part of, a, of an Israeli government and, and to have to have responsibility if Israel went to war with Hamas or Hezbollah. They didn't want to be part of, uh, of, of having to share the responsibility for a war against uh, fellow Arabs. And on the Jewish side, we didn't trust the Arab politicians for very good reason. Many of the Arab politicians have supported uh, Hezbollah or Hamas over the years, have supported terrorism, deny Israel's right to exist as a Jewish state. But this year, we had the first Arab party. And what was so extraordinary about it is that this was not just an Arab party, it was a part, an Islamist party, a party with Muslim Brotherhood roots. And what made it even more extraordinary is that the leader of this party, Mansour Abbas, declared a few months ago that Israel is a Jewish state, it was created as a Jewish state, and it will remain a Jewish state. So what that tells me is that when we, the Jewish majority, treat our fellow Arab citizens as part of the process, we bring them in and they have a stake in the process, then there's an opening that's created for Arab Israelis to accept the legitimacy of Israel as a Jewish state. And that's what happened this year. Many Israeli Jews didn't notice that or just dismissed it. But I think something historic happened here. 
And so to answer your question, to connect it with what's happening, with what's happened in the last year, there's a shift that's happening in part of the Arab Israeli community, a willingness to finally come to terms with the right of the Jewish people to a state, provided that that state is not only Jewish, but also democratic. And this government modeled what it means to be both a Jewish and a democratic state. That was the beauty of this government. And so my hope is that before we were speaking about the changes in the region. And now we're speaking about the changes within Arab society inside Israel. Between the region and Arab Israelis are the Palestinians. And I would like to see pressure going from both directions. I'd like to see an Israeli offer on the table for a two-state solution that, that that leaves out the right of return. There is no right of return to the state of Israel. There's a right of return only to a Palestinian state to put the offer on the table and have the Arab world and Arab Israelis pressuring the Palestinians. Here's a deal. Why aren't you accepting it? But we have to put the deal on the table first for that to happen. Okay, yeah. So, <laughs> what do you think is going to happen in the new election? With the election? Yeah. I'm very worried. I'm, I'm, yeah? I'm very worried because, well, first of all, I'm worried about Netanyahu. He, um, I think that Netanyahu in the past uh, was a good leader, a, a credible leader. He, ha he, he has some major accomplishments economically. Uh, I think that um, he deserves a great deal of credit for leading the campaign uh, against Iran. He really is responsible for, for creating the international atmosphere uh, in which Iran, the Iranian nuclear threat was seen uh, as, 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 as an urgent issue to deal with. I don't like the way the international community has dealt with the issue. I, I want to see a much more credible military threat to Iran. But um, nevertheless, uh, Netanyahu really uh, galvanized much of the, the, the attention and, uh, and opposition to Iran. In the last few years since his legal problems, uh, Netanyahu is no longer a credible leader. He's looking out only for his own self-interest. That's my perception. And he, I don't see, I don't, when I listen to him, I don't hear a leader who has Israel's interests front and center. I think that, that he's lost that. So my first, my first concern is that we will be, is that if Netanyahu returns, uh, we will be electing a leader whose primary motive is his own personal legal problems. Uh, I think that Netanyahu will try to dismantle much of the legal system, and that is a major threat to Israeli democracy. And Netanyahu is also going to be bringing in a, an openly racist party. We have never had a, a racist party in an Israeli government. And Netanyahu has legitimized this party I'm speaking about the party of uh, Ben Gvir and Smotrich mm -hmm. called, uh, they call themselves religious Zionism, which is a, 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 a disgrace because religious Zionism is, 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 a, is a, um, a movement, a historic movement with, uh, with a great deal of, of legitimacy and it's an essential part of the Israeli story. And they've hijacked that name for an extreme right-wing racist party. And um, so I'm really worried about that coalition. I'm worried about the ultra-Orthodox coming back in. Uh, I'm, I'm worried about a, a, an ultra-Orthodox, ultra-nationalist coalition headed by a corrupt prime mm -hmm. minister. I, I, it's, it's, it's a nightmarish scenario. And so um, I, I hope that Netanyahu will not be able to form a government, and then uh, we'll be will and and I believe that he if 
if he's not able to form a government now, after five elections, uh, the sense in the political system is that the Likud is finally going to get rid of him. And, uh, and then we're going to, then we'll have a more mainstream normative right-wing coalition. It will be a right-wing coalition because the country is right-wing. Israel today is a majority right wing, and there's no way to, to avoid that. But if you look at the parties that, that form this outgoing government, what's so interesting is that three of the parties are right wing. And uh, those parties, I'm speaking about the New Hope Party of Gidon Saar, Bennett's Yamina, and uh, Lieberman's uh, Yisrael Beitenu. Three right wing parties broke with the right-wing coalition because of, of uh, they wouldn't sit with Netanyahu. As soon as Netanyahu is gone, you will have a much larger right-wing coalition, which will naturally form a government, and hopefully without the extreme right racist party. And then you'll have a normal right-wing government. And that's legitimate. That's, that's a reflection of, 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 of the will of the Israeli public. But let's not have a government that depends on a racist party as um, for, for, for its 61 seats. That's, that's a historic disaster to, right. to, to my mind. So Yossi, uh, let me change subject and try to bring to them. What the project that they're working now on, describe your new book for us, please. What they're working in. Well, uh, the book is about the, well, it, it begins with the question, how did the Jewish people get from the lowest point in our history, which was 1945, to what I believe is the peak of Jewish history, which is today. We have never been stronger. We've never been more central on the world stage. Uh, the Jewish people, Judaism, Jewish ideas, the state of Israel, has never been more a part of the global conversation. Not always in a good way, it's true, but certainly we, we have never been so central to, to, to the world's consciousness uh, as we are today. And we've never been in a better position to defend ourselves. And so that's the starting point of the book. And the book makes the argument that the, the Jewish people today, uh, we, we need to rethink our relationship with the Holocaust and that we are not a victim people. We are not just the people that experience the Holocaust. We are primarily the people that defeated the Holocaust, that overcame the Holocaust. And, that, and so I'm looking at how we did it how did, how, and re, I'm really focusing on the two main centers of Jewish life, the state of Israel and American Jewry, and looking at, at, at how this was, how these two centers transformed Jewish life and, and defeated the Shoah. And then I'm going to look at the problems that the Jewish people are facing in the 21st century, the rise of anti-Zionism, the, the growing disunity within the Jewish people and looking at, at how we can deal with the issues that we're facing from this perspective of the Jews as a survivor people that had the wisdom and the strength to defeat the worst uh, blow in our history. And so that's really what the book really is about in a way, the last 70 years and the next 70 years. So. Looks wonderful. Oh, thank you. We are I, hope to, I hope it'll be translated into Portuguese. Yeah, we are eager to translate <laughs> it. We are just waiting for you to finish it. <laughs> we have a question, right? Uh, sí. Um, a gente tem aqui umas perguntas uh, de Isadora uh, Milagres. Você acha possível uma solução de retorno para os refugiados palestinos 
¿En qué forma? I, I just heard the, la the end of the question. Could, could the translator repeat it, please? Uh, is someone translating? Yes, yes. Okay. I, 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 I hear it now. Okay. Yes, yes. Uh, could you repeat the question? Ah, ok. Eh, si você haya posible que o tema dos refugiados tenga una solución, si realmente puede se dar o retorno dos refugiados eh, palestinos. Well, first of all, we're not talking about refugees anymore. We're talking about the descendants of refugees, and that's a very important distinction to make. Uh, secondly, uh, the, ref the descendants of refugees uh, will never be able to return to a country that they didn't live in, which is the state of Israel. There will be no return to the state of Israel. But if there is a two-state solution, then of course the Palestinian state will, will absorb any Palestinians from their diaspora who want to go home. In the same way that I, as, a, as an American-born Jew, Uh, showed up one day at Ben Gurion Airport and said, "I'm home and I and I want citizenship." Uh, the the Palestinian state, I imagine, will function in in in, in the same way, but uh, there certainly will not be what the Palestinians call a right of return to this to Israel. That's never never going to happen, no matter who, no matter which party is in power in Israel. Ok, thank you. Y otra pregunta también de well, Isadora. Daniel, Daniel, okay. ask him in, in English. It's better. Ah, ok. Um, so, uh, what do you think about the last, uh, the recently um, visit of uh, President Biden in Israel? Uh, how uh, this uh, visit influenced um, has an influence in the, in, the, in the Israeli political. In the in influence on what? Of the, the, the visit of Biden in the, in the political of Israel. Oh, you mean in terms of our election? Yes. Well, it's, uh, you know, Biden obviously is, is, um, is hoping that, that Yair Lapid will, will win. Uh, I don't see, any real possibility of that happening. Um, the, the hope is that um, even, 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 a few, even a few parliamentary seats will shift from the right to the center. And if that happens, then Netanyahu will not be able to put a government together. And then we'll have a different coalition. So I don't think, you know, and I'm speaking as a centrist voter, I, I, I'm a Yair Lapid supporter. Uh, my camp is not going to win, uh, but we can try to prevent Netanyahu from winning. And then uh, a more um, legitimate right-wing uh, coalition will come, will come to power with Lieberman supporting it, with, with Gidon Saar and, uh, prob and, uh, and, so it, and Benny Gantz, the blue and white party. So uh, I think we're really looking at, at, and I hope that Biden, uh, by standing so, you know, with, I, I, I think that, that we've, we've seen a very interesting interaction in the last day between, uh, the last two days between Yair Lapid and Biden. Uh, I, think Yair, I think Lapid has, has grown in his public stature in Israel. And the, uh, the latest polls show that um, Netanyahu is now leading against him on, on, a, on a personal basis. You know, they ask who is most fit to be prime minister. Now in a coalition system, it doesn't, it doesn't matter because you vote for a party. But Netanyahu in the past was leading by 20, 30 points. Now he's leading by eight or nine points. So I'm hoping that Biden's visit will have will move a few seats from from the right to the center, 
Uh, and that could make a tremendous difference in, uh, in the elections. We just need two seats, right? Yeah, that's it. That's right. Yeah. Okay. So, so we uh, are... Yes. Um, no, I, I, sorry. No, please, 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 Raul. No, no, no. Oh, so I'm, this... I'm just, I'm just that aware that uh, we are finishing our, our time. It's about three o'clock in Brazil. Yes. So, uh, Yossi, we want uh, uh, really to thank you so much uh, wow. for stand, staying, staying with us today. Uh, really, it was a pressure for us. And do you want to, to say last words for, for us? Yeah, well, first of all, it was a pleasure for me as well. And I'm, I'm very grateful to all of you for, for standing with Israel, for, uh, for, um, for upholding the, the good name of Israel and the Jewish people. And I know it's not always easy, not in Brazil and, and not, not in, in other places. And uh, I'm very, very appreciative for all the work that you do. And I'm delighted to meet the Brazilian Jewish community. This is a new experience for me. And uh, really, really happy to, to, uh, to be in Portuguese, to be a Portuguese writer, <laughs> to be a Brazilian <laughs> writer. And, uh, and I look forward to further engagement. Thank you. Ok. Um, eu queria também agradecer muito a presença de, de Raul Gottlieb. Eh, también okay. para todo, todo equipo de, de, de CIPI, de Stand With Us, que fez posible realmente eh, este, este evento. También falar que esta conversa eh, va a ficar eh, disponible en los canales eh, de, de YouTube de CIPI, Editora Contexto, eh, Stand With Us Brasil, si ustedes quieren nuevamente asistir. Eh, y también que ustedes pueden compartir con quien tenga interés de, de asistir nuevamente a esta, a esta increíble palestra de, de Yossi Klein Alevi. Obrigados a todos y hasta la próxima. También sugiero mucho comprar el libro eh, que yo ya tengo aquí, que realmente es un libro increíble que trae otras eh, visiones de lo que la gente está acostumbrada a leer sobre el conflicto. Eh, israelense palestino. Obrigado y buena tarde. Thank you. Thank you, Yoss.